welcome everyone. I'm super excited to be here despite the rainy morning. Thanks a lot for joining. My name is Gergely Doruci. I'm from the Spare Course team. And this talk will focus on how to utilize cloud compute resources in the most efficient way. And uh, before sharing about the Spare Course project, I would like to do a quick intro about why I think this is important and how can uh, you save costs with this. I've been working as a data scientist, director of analytics, senior director of data operations for the past decade, and uh, was managing infrastructure for the data science team, uh, managing many, many jobs run every day, like SQL, of course, which is very lightweight, at least on the client side, usually running R or Python or other scripts which might be a lightweight task as well, like uh, training a linear model, API integrations, and so on, but usually training a model with very, very varying uh, resource requirements. To give you an example, this is a screenshot from a couple years ago uh, when we were monitoring our Docker containers every few seconds. And here you can see the CPU utilization in this column. It's barely hitting 100%. So this job is tied to a single core, probably training a hierarchical model which cannot uh, scale to multiple cores, but the memory usage is relatively high. It's using around 200 gigs of memory, and uh, we had around 4,000 of these jobs running every single day, of course, with varying resource requirements. Some, like the previous one, a model in R. We had been training uh, GBMs, neural nets, also some NLP models requiring GPUs, uh, submitting bits to APIs on ad networks, and so on. So very, very different requirements for the jobs. So we were looking for a solution, how to handle all these different requirements and how to choose an instance for a job. And uh, many years ago, we were using ECS with some sketchy bash scripts to spin up uh, EC2 nodes and run our job there. It was relatively fragile and not a lot of fun working with this. So we were relatively excited when AWS Bash was announced uh, with the promise of managing the infrastructure for us. So we keep defining the task definitions and AWS will create the cluster for us, uh, spin up the instances as needed. It worked really nicely for a couple of months, but we have been seeing unexpected costs, uh, mostly due to developers, data scientists, misconfiguring their jobs. For example, they didn't want to get an alert on a Friday night or over the weekend because uh, server ran out of memory, so they just asked for a lot of memory, which makes sense from a perspective, but we were burning a lot of money. Similar to Kubernetes and all the other orchestrating tools, over-provisioning is a real problem. And uh, also, I think when it comes to batch jobs and training statistical models, bin packing is just not working, as it's working really nicely for microservices. Just imagine that you start a job like the previous one I mentioned with a couple hundred gigabytes of memory to train a model, and then AWS batch, Kubernetes, whatever, starts to put other jobs on the same node with lower resource requirements. Then your job finishes, and you have that huge monster still running with tiny jobs on it. And you are, of course, paying for uh, the large machine. So instead, we decided to roll our own solution, uh, which was building on the fact that the pricing of the nodes uh, doesn't give a discount for the size of the machine. So if you're putting two containers on a large machine versus putting those two containers on two separate nodes, that makes no difference from a pricing perspective. So we created a Python script uh, as a pilot which was tracking all our jobs every second, Take, uh, looking at the CPU utilization, memory usage. So in this job, you can see that it's like 10,000%. So it's, it can scale to 100 cores very easily. This job was using a bit more than 300 gigs of memory. So we looked up the related uh, instances that can run this job. And in a loop, we try to start uh, each of these uh, in different AZs to keep the costs uh, at low. Once the job finished, we recorded, of course, the exit code, uh, updated the usage statistics so that we know next time what kind of instances might be needed. If something failed, then we retried with higher uh, resources and so on. It's like Forgate or Google Cloud Run, but it's auto-scaling and uh, much, much cheaper compared to those solutions uh, because we are tracking uh, 
uh, both the jobs and also what's available. So it seemed to be useful for many other use cases at the company. Uh, folks have been using in traditional CI CD workflows, uh, building Docker images, compiling software, stuff like that. So we decided to, and we were su uh, supported to open source this. Uh, it was called CloudPerf. We have been maintaining it for a couple of years, but it was uh, limited to a single vendor. We also had some other ideas. Uh, we also managed to uh, get some funding from NGI Search to work on the next generation of this project. So that's how we started Spare Course, which is an ecosystem of open source tools, some open data, documentation, and so on. We also provide managed infrastructure, uh, public databases, so that you do not have to actually run our Python tooling. We run that every well, every five minutes and make the data available for free publicly so that you can use it. We also host APIs, provide SDKs so that you can query that data easily. We also create CLI tools so that you can start those machines easily. Uh, you do not have to use the AWS uh, CLI tool or GCP or, or all the others. You have a unified tool to start all the machines. And we are also working on a SaaS solution so that you do not even need to engage with the vendors directly. You give us a Docker image, a command to run, maybe a credit card, and we will find this right spot to run your machine. Let it be in a region of AWS or GCP Hatzner or, or, or whatever. To give you some stats on what's available in spare cores nowadays, uh, you can see that uh, we are limited to three vendors right now. Uh, that should go up to eight in a month or two, but we are already tracking more than a thousand server types and actually running different benchmarks on those hardware discoveries and so on, adding up to more than a hundred thousand metrics uh, that we know about these machines. Just speaking about the life prices, it's again well over 100,000 because we are looking at spot on demand prices in all ACs and uh, looking at the historical records, it's, it's getting like a sizable data set. Uh, the easiest way to look at this data is using our web component, which is a traditional view, some filters on the left-hand side, and you can see the search results on the right. Once you click on one of those, you get the server details. Uh, some of these are pretty standard, like uh, these numbers can be queried from the vendor APIs. We are also running our own stuff for hardware discovery so that you know about the level one, two, three cache amounts, uh, the actual CPU model, and so on. Pricing is available for all regions and AZs. That's pretty standard as well, and there are already other listings on the internet which provides those. I think this is pretty new. So we start all those more than a thousand servers, run our benchmarks there, uh, run our hardware discovery, and publish plots like this one and the actual numbers as well, both on the home page, and you can download the SQL Lite dataset as well. Looking at the memory bandwidth example, you can see that we are doing read, write, and mixed operations using different uh, block sizes. We also put the level one, level two, and three uh, cache amounts uh, for reference. Uh, benchmarking different compression algos. So here you can see that uh, the bandwidth of the compression as a function of the compression ratio, how it looks like for different algos so that you can uh, select which one might make sense for your actual use case. Like ZPAC is pretty crazy, compressing down to like 20%. OpenSSL uh, block ciphers, hash functions are also benchmarked using different block sizes. Also running Geekbench 6, which has been a standard benchmarking tool for quite a few years, uh, implementing work cases like text and image processing, compiling software, and so on. So hopefully everyone can find uh, their best matching scores. We create tables like this one. You can compare any servers and any number of servers in a table like this one for human inspection. For computers, we provide APIs and SDKs as well. For example, in Python, you can query this machine, some metadata printed uh, about the CPUs, including C CPU speed and things like that, which might not be available even on the vendor homepage. Uh, looking at the memory, you can see it's a previous generation of SD, RAM, the related speed. And when it comes to GPUs, we are even looking at the firmware and BIOS version. So if that's something you might uh, require for your job, you can get it from the database. So all this is made available f uh, by a list of uh, components. 
And the first one is the crawler. Uh, to keep it short, it's our data ingest framework, uh, defining the database schemas, and also defining how we can get data from the uh, vendor APIs. We have to provide some manual list, for example, for the vendors and also some metadata for them when the vendors were founded, which compliance frameworks have been implemented there. So we try to enrich that data with manually collected data points as well. A lot of API integrations, not only the standard things like server prices, but for example, IPv4 address price as well, which has been relatively new uh, for the past few months. And uh, of course, integrating the hardware discovery and benchmark results. Uh, honestly, we thought that this would be super easy. Uh, we have seen some issues with uh, creating this package, and I would like to point out some of these. Time is short, so I will just uh, refer to some references, and feel free to take a closer look if you are interested. So handling all the overlapping compound foreign keys in an ORM is quite a mess sometimes. Also, we are taking care of SCD tables so that you can also track price change changes over time and all other changes uh, uh, within the database. Uh, providing the database schema migration tools for all the major uh, database engines, uh, building on the top of Alembic, supporting both online and offline migrations. But uh, to give you an example of updating a single column from not null to null label uh, required us to write quite a lot, like uh, providing the table definition, taking care of if we are working with an SCD or non-SCD table, upgrade and downgrade path, so uh, there are some work to be done which we haven't seen upcoming, but on the user side, it's relatively straightforward to use. You run schemas upgrade on your database, and you are up to the most recent version of the uh, crawler uh, database, uh, either using SQLite, Postgres, or, or any other uh, database engines. As I mentioned previously, there are very uh, varying quality and even availability of data points at different uh, vendors. And it, before you ask if ChatGPT can provide that information, honestly, uh, spare cores is safe from AI taking its job. Like looking at if this guy can find the storage for this instance type, you can see that in real time it looked at six sites, actually found how many. Uh, HDDs are in this server, but multiplying these two numbers was just too difficult for this test, so uh, we still have some work to do here. Uh, and there are some issues, like I mentioned previously, like some vendors do not provide in a structured way the information about if the server has local storage or not. We had to parse that out from the description. Uh, CPU information is often not available within the vendor APIs. We had to extract that from home page. Uh, we also had to do some manual mappings. And to give you a simple example, region, that's a relatively straightforward concept. And if I show you an example, EU West 1, that's probably familiar to everyone. It's a region in AWS going by the name Europe Ireland. But on the console, sometimes it's referred to EU Ireland, and even some API endpoints are referring to this guy as EU instead of Europe. So we already have three names for the same region. We are standardizing that and also creating an API reference column in our database so that you know that you have to refer to this region with this ID. For GCP, this is actually the name, but you do not have to know about this because you can just use this column. And we also provide some extra information regarding that. The pricing is even more messy, and without getting into the details, uh, there's a vendor where if you would like to look up the pricing of a server, first you have to get the pricing list. There's no way to search that pricing list. You get 100 megabytes of JSON and you search locally, and you do the search by looking up the instance family. And that instance family needs to be matched by a description for the SKUs. So you are already doing some text processing to do the lookup. And then you look the pricing of a single CPU core, memory amount. You multiply that with the available cores and memory for the server, multiply these two numbers. Don't ask ChatGPT to do that, if you remember. And then uh, you get the server price. Sometimes it's even more complicated, like you have to add up like eight numbers. 
Anyway, we have a clean database published. This is a SQLite file updated every five minutes. You can download it, use it, or use our APIs to query it. Uh, the next component is actually the data uh, package and uh, releases. As I mentioned previously, it's updated every five minutes. We are using GitHub Actions for everything, so everything is running in a public way, and uh, you can look at the outputs and the results as well. And there are some data shared uh, here about the size of the database, and uh, that we also provide a Python package so that you can import it and you have access to the data update, auto-updated as part of the data Python package every five or 10 minutes. The next component, which is probably the most exciting uh, for this project is the inspector. So we actually run some stuff on all these servers. Uh, for the hardware inspection tools, you can see the list of things that we run, and we also run different benchmarks. Please take a look at the related uh, uh, GitHub repo for the details about what's being actually run. Stress NG uh, seems to be one of the best to measure the single core and uh, multi core performance of the server. Again, this is running on GitHub Actions, so you can see all the jobs here actually creating the cloud servers, running the benchmarks parsing the results and then cleaning up, so terminating all the cloud servers. The data is not only provided as a SQLite database, but we commit everything back to GitHub. So in this folder structure, you can find all the instance types, the benchmarks and hardware inspection tools, uh, the standard out, standard error of all these processes, the parsed results, and some metadata as well. If you like, you can also run the inspector on your machine so that you can compare uh, how your laptop, your supercomputer, or whatever compares to uh, these cloud instances uh, using some of these Docker images. Regarding the runner, like how we are starting the machines, uh, we are created uh, working on this runner component. This is relatively straightforward to use. If you are relying on Docker, then you provide the create command, the name of the vendor, and the instance type. And in the background, we are using Pulumi uh, stack templates that we are maintaining to create all the security groups, VPCs, if not created, subnets, and so on, if required. And uh, after a few seconds, you should have a running machine, and you can run your stuff, and you can also use Pulumi to clean up, so building on uh, open source software here as well. Some interesting issues we have run into. Uh, we were not able to run actually all AWS instances because we have run into some quotas. Like uh, you can have access to, in this case, only eight vCPUs within the F instance family. So we managed to get quota updates for some instance families and we failed with some of those. And after some time, we actually hit a quota update request quota, which I found quite hilarious. But uh, anyway, hopefully we will be able to get through all the machines. Regarding the Keeper uh, component, this is an HTTP API implemented with FastAPI in Python. You can see a quick example here uh, using curl to hit uh, this endpoint, which is publicly accessible. Of course, if you wish, you can also host this API for uh, your own environment. The result is relatively large, like just getting information about the single server will print all the CPU information, like the CPU flags and all the tiny details that we have collected for this server, which might be useful. Um, GPUs, like mentioned previously, storages. Uh, all the related tables and relationships are resolved, so you can get all the information about the vendor, uh, and you get all the prices in all regions. And if I scroll to the bottom, I think we will see some examples of the benchmarks as well, like this RESNG uh, CPU all score is printed here. Uh, of course, we provide this figure, and. Uh, and the Redoc uh, documentation for all these. And just some fun fact, we did a quick uh, open AI API integration so that when you are using the home page, you do not actually need to click around in the sidebar to uh, search for the minimum vCPU cores and minimum memory, but you provide a free text. And ChatGPT is actually pretty good at uh, you know, structuring unstructured text and providing the suggested filters. Fun fact, here it actually managed to do the math. So 
uh, looking up that memory minimum should be at least 32 gigs. It's not always succeeding, so I had to do a few trials to make this screenshot, but in most cases, this works. I've already included a few screenshots from the web component. Please take a look. Besides the charts, we also have this, I think, pretty cool slot machine so that you put in the number of CPUs you need, the RAM, you click, spin, and using real-time pricing info, it will just show you which is the best uh, compute <coughs> resource to run. <coughs> I mean, uh, the cheapest <coughs> in this case. Uh, because running out of time, I will skip our future plans, but there's plenty to do. Uh, we have funding until around October, so that's uh, great to cover the development work, and we also got support to spin up all these machines and burn some credits uh, to uh, get these benchmarks and hardware discovery results for you. As you can see here, I'm in a good company. I'm super grateful to work with these two other mysterious guys who are taking care of some of the infrastructure and the front end as well. And also grateful for Next Generation Internet and GI Search for the funding uh, so that we can work on this and uh, the kill signal were received. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And before stopping, if you have time again, please visit the homepage. And uh, I'm very happy to take questions offline. So you can find my email address there, or I will be around and very happy to chat in person. And uh, yeah, stopping here right now. And uh, thank you very much again.